three seconds of my life. <laughs> so that was the big surprise that it, we've never had it freeze before. But it has froze a lot, unfortunately. That's true. That's yeah. true. Uh, Mark Neal is coming next week. I'm Pastor Carrie. Pastor Matt. And we are, we're the lead pastors here at Tide. And um, when we had the opportunity for Mark to come, we were like, oh my gosh, yes, but we don't want him to have to like close out fundamentalist. So what you're going to get today is actually a tag team sermon. You're going to hear from me uh, for week seven, and then you're going to do week eight. Like, yeah. Yeah. Everybody's like, oh, what's the big surprise? And, uh, and then you're like, oh, I get to hear two sermons. <laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> Listen, listen. Not okay. one, but two. It's All right. going to be really so. good. So um, the reason we're doing this series, like have you ever been in church before or been to a church and been like, man, these people, they know their Wait, Bible. Wait, am I supposed to just like sit down now? No, not yet. You okay. have to stay for this part. Okay. We're like tag teaming okay. right now. Like we're preaching together. Like here, come, come. Okay. Come here. This is good. All right. Perfect. We practice this. This is all part of the script. Um, <laughs> no, but have you ever been to a church and you're like, man, these people know their Bible, but I don't know if they know Jesus. And like, have you ever seen that before? Have you ever seen that before? Right, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I have. And so what we wanted to do through this series was come up with a list of things that people have to believe. What do you have to believe? What are the essentials? Mm -hmm. What are we essentials? Because when I look at all of these churches, the only thing that I feel like I see that we all have in common is that we all think we're right mm -hmm. about everything and that everybody else is wrong about everything. And there's just no way that's actually true. Right? 100%. Okay. You're... <laughs> I'm Do you listening. want to sit down? No, I'm listening. <laughs> I'm captivated. It's a good view up here. <laughs> All right. Here, why don't you do this part right here? What's that? This part right here. Oh, when secondary issues become essentials? Yeah, in our churches, what yeah. happens? Somebody somewhere is going to get left out. And, and as they step out, what they, what they start to do is they start to deconstruct. Whether they, that whether they intend to or not. And what we... You're supposed to move your mic down. What we mean by deconstruct... <laughs> you guys are so lucky. It's simply to sort out what's essential and what's not essential. Ooh, that is better. That's, that feels better. Yeah, that's good. Um, and so, like, the, those non-essential things, they become, like, woven into the fabric of our churches. And we, we see this all the time where people do things and they don't even know why they're doing them anymore. And so what we wanted to do was come up with, like, eight things mm -hmm. in seven weeks. In seven weeks, yes. Um, that, that are essential. And so let's start with number one. Uh, Jeff did number one, right? He Jeff, did. He was number one. So number one was Jesus is God's son in our, and our king. Yes. And then I did week two, Jesus came to illustrate and demonstrate what God is like. I did week three, which is Jesus defines sin as anything that harms you or others. And then I, I, was, I, I, I preached week four, which was Jesus promised justice in the end and invites us to trust him in the meantime. Um, Jesus died for your sin to reconcile you to God. Yeah, and then last week, uh, Pastor Jason did week six, and that was the church is God's agent of transformation personally, culturally, and globally. Also the longest one. It was also the longest one. Yeah, he, he wins. That's good. So um, I'm going to do week seven really quick, and I'll see you. Oh, okay. So in a now I leave. Now you leave. Okay, great. So, this was never not the plan. Matt Dilly, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Dr. Matt Dilly. So maybe as we were going through all six of those essentials, maybe you noticed and maybe you didn't, but those essentials, they follow the life of Jesus. And we talk about all the time that Jesus came to this earth as a baby and that that was very unexpected, but, but what, I, what I love about that is that Jesus came as a baby, which meant that he had to start at the beginning. He didn't start by dying on the cross for us, he had to build up to that. And I think one of the things that's been woven into the fabric of the church is that we start new Christians out at the end. Okay, we start with the resurrection. And, and, oh, and it's true because one of the things that we do say all the time here at Tribe is that we want to anchor our faith to the event that created the movement that created the Bible. We say that all the time, but that doesn't mean that that's where our faith starts. That's just where it anchors. 
what we start with, what we start all the way down when we're in like tribe babies and tribe littles and tribe little kids, we start with Jesus as God's son and he's our king. And then we build up to that first reason that Jesus came to earth, which was to illustrate and demonstrate what God is like. And we see people start to grow. We see babies start to grow up. And we see adults who maybe hadn't, didn't grow up in church. They, they start with Jesus as our, God's son and our king. And he came to illustrate and to demonstrate what God is like. And then as that relationship grows, we start to recognize that there is some stuff in us that's not good. <laughs> Uh, we, we start to realize that sin in our life is, um, is harming us and others, and so we want to we start to, to stop doing that, right? And so then we start to reconcile with that. Um, and then as we reconcile that, we might start to notice, hey, there's some stuff in some people that I love of, in their life that maybe they need to, to knock off. And so then we have to wrestle with the fact that Jesus promised justice in the end. And that we just have to trust him in the meantime. And when you've done that work, then you're ready for the next step, which is that Jesus died for our sin to reconcile us to God. And that's where we see baptism. After baptism, what a lot of times we see is we start to see people really got to get involved in church. Chloe and Kobe, are, they're on the front row up here. They don't know I'm going to do this. But they got baptized a couple weeks ago and and or like several weeks ago and do you know what they did a couple weeks ago they came to us and they're like hey we we're, we got to serve we got to do something we got we, we got this overflow pastor mark neal next week is going to say i almost promise you that you have not been called to ministry you've been called to intimacy and the thing is that's true of everyone in this room not just the people who we call pastor and your ministry is an overflow of that intimacy that you have with God. And so that's where we see that the church is God's agent of transformation personally and culturally and, and, and professionally and globally. And this process, these first six essentials, they're, they're a process and it's called discipleship. And as soon as I say discipleship, a lot of the like churchy people, they just kind of clock out. So don't clock out on me because and if you're like a brand new Christian, you're like, I don't know what that is. That's a big fancy word. I'm not sure about that. What is discipleship and how do I do discipleship? And am I discipleship? And I don't, I don't actually know for sure. But discipleship is just a fancy Christian way of saying making people into Jesus followers. Making people into Jesus followers. It's our, our seventh fundamental and it actually comes from Jesus's final command, the very last thing he said during his time on earth before his ascension into heaven. It's after the resurrection. He's appeared to the apostles a bunch of times in, in different rooms, and he keeps getting into rooms that he shouldn't be able to get into, and he sees people on the road to Emmaus, and sometimes they recognize him, and sometimes they don't, and it's interesting, and, and so he appears to uh, the people who've been following him a bunch of times, and he tells them all, hey, I want to meet up with you in Galilee. And they all knew where Galilee was. A lot of those original followers were from Galilee. Life was a little safer in Galilee. And, and Matthew was in Galilee, uh, which was really helpful for us because Matthew documented what happened. Then the 11 disciples, 11, because Judas was no longer with them, 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they see him, they did what all of us are going to do someday when we come face to face with Jesus. I hear, I hear people say all the time, well, when I get to heaven, I have some questions. I'm going to, you know, pester and demand answers, and I want to understand everything in my own context. I love you, and you're so cute, but no, you won't. That's not how it's going to go down, because it says in Matthew 28, 17, when they saw him, they worshiped. And I love what Matthew records next because I can just hear as like the other apostles are reading it or maybe they're reading over his shoulder as he's writing or maybe they come back to it later and they're like, oh, why didn't you include that? Because when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And I think this is a little verse of comfort right here because these guys saw all the things and smelled all the smells. They're standing in front of their resurrected Lord, and it's still hard for them to believe. 
We know because we have the book of Acts that they did all believe and they all went on to do the things that Jesus asked them to do, even though it meant that most of them would lose their lives in really hard, terrible ways. And we know that from the pages of history as well. But we also know that sometimes it's hard to believe. Sometimes it sounds a little too good to be true. Sometimes it sounds a little bit weird. Like sometimes it just doesn't seem like something that could have possibly happened. And it gives me a little bit of hope on those days when it's hard to believe that the people who saw it with their own eyes still had moments of doubt. So Jesus launches into his farewell address. And then Jesus said to them, all authority, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. People sometimes get upset with us when we elevate the Gospels over other parts of the Bible. And we agree that every part of the Bible is important. But saying that everything is important is also the same way of saying that nothing is. And this verse might be the most important one. Because Jesus is saying that all authority, all of it in heaven and on earth has been given to him. And I think maybe it's in this moment that the apostles really start to realize, they start to get it, that Jesus isn't their final king. And he isn't the final king in Jerusalem. He is the final king of the whole world. When people elevate every verse in the Bible to the same level, what happens is the Bible becomes the ultimate authority here on earth. And that sounds okay, but it's not. And you have to read the Bible, ironically, in order to find this. And you have to look at history and you can read the works of Josephus and things like that to see that, that when we make the Bible the ultimate authority, it is so easy to leverage the Bible to hurt the people that God loves. <laughs> And the Bible says that Jesus said that all authority on heaven and earth has been given to him. Jesus said that Jesus is our ultimate authority. And yeah, his words and his acts and deeds, they are recorded in the Bible, but that's not the only thing that's recorded in the Bible. But the words of Jesus are that final authority because he's our king. What the Jewish people had before Jesus, they had Abraham and Moses, they had the Torah and it wasn't that what they had was incomplete. It was just that it was a shadow. It was a shadow of what was to come. And the shadow caster, the, sh the shadow caster had finally come. And when the scope of that statement hits you, you would do the same thing that they did. When they saw him, they worshiped. And in that moment, I think Jesus' guys realize something else. I think they realize that they are Jesus' guys. Like, it's obvious. They're on a mountain, okay? Like, you've been on a mountain. Like, I, you can go to a mountain on a Tuesday afternoon and be like, oh, my gosh. Like, right? Like, that, that sense of awe that we get. You're like, I am so small and insignificant. Like, so they're on a mountain. They're already feeling that. They know something big is about to happen with Jesus. And so... Um, they know it's going to be up to them to tell the story. And, and we see a little while later in this verse in the book of Acts that I just, I love. I added that this morning. I feel so bad for our slide team, but I just, I couldn't resist. It's when they saw the courage of John and Peter, this is they like the people, when they saw the courage of John and Peter and they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus, with Jesus. Jesus, they had been with Jesus because once you realize that you are with Jesus, that you're one of his guys, that you're one of his girls, that, that realization comes with some accountability, right? Because once you realize that God, Jesus is God's son and he's our king and that he came to illustrate and demonstrate what God is like and that, that makes you start thinking about your sin, which Jesus defines as anything that harms you or others. And it's maybe even going to make you think about the sin of others and you have to reconcile with the fact, you have to wrestle with the fact that Jesus asks us to trust him now. He's promised justice in the end and you have to trust him in the meantime. And you realize that that Jesus died for your sin to reconcile you to the God who loves you. And that the church is God's agent of transformation personally, culturally, and globally. When the enormity of what it means to be 
with Jesus. That's when that accountability piece kicks in. It changes you. It challenges you. And if you know your Bible, you know what's coming next. And if you don't, that's okay too, because I bet you can sense it with the way that all of this has been leading, because what comes next is the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples. The implication is that as you are going, like as you're, as you're living your life, as you're doing whatever it is that you do, your responsibility is to make more Jesus followers. For the rest of your life, as you go, you have the, the responsibility, the accountability to make more Jesus followers, to live in such a way that people say, like, whatever it is that she has, I want it. Whatever it is that he has that lets him respond to that thing in that way, I need that in my life. I need that peace that passes understanding. It's good to have goals, but I think the most important life goal is that there would be more Jesus followers because of you than there were before you got here. Therefore, make go and make disciples of all people groups, of all people groups. This is where... I think some of the apostles are probably like, all right, now, nah, hang on, pump the brakes here. Jesus, the Gentiles, really? The Samaritans? The Romans? Like, you telling us you want us to make disciples of, of all of these people? That, that t they're going to be Jesus followers of all, of all nations? Like, even, even the people we hate? Like, even the people who, who hate us? Therefore, go and make disciples of all people groups, baptizing them. This is full inclusion. This is, this is no distinction between the people who were born into the faith and the people who found it later in life. And, and I, I know where we are now, but like, this was radical. Okay, before Jesus, the only way to be Jewish was to be born Jewish. That was the only way to be a part of God's family. There were dietary restrictions and moral and modesty restrictions and rules for everything, including not letting people who were not Jewish into your house and not going into their houses. And now, all of a sudden, we're sitting at the same table sharing a meal of surf and turf cooked in butter. I put that joke in for Karen to zone. You're welcome, Karen. <laughs> Therefore, go and make disciples of all people groups, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There would be no distinction between the people who were born in the faith and the people who hadn't. They were all going to be part of the family of God through baptism. And I think sometimes we blast right through that ending because we've heard it a thousand times, but, but this was so offensive to the Father and the Son, like to include him, to elevate himself to that level, like Unless what he was saying was true, this was crazy. No mere mortal can claim this. Only the true son of God. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And this next part of the Great Commission is, I think, where people like me, we've been getting it wrong for a really long time. Because the next part says, teaching them to obey everything that you have commanded, everything I have commanded you. Go and make disciples teaching them. This goes so much farther, so much farther beyond just belief. Jesus is telling us that we need to teach the people to obey all of the things that he's taught us to do. And we need to teach them to be Jesus' followers. And I, I think in the church, a lot of times, we, we treat discipleship kind of like this. We're like, hi, I'm, I'm Carrie. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And do you want to go to hell or do you want to go to heaven? Like, do you choose fire or do you choose streets of gold? What do you pick? And then we dunk them. And then we're like, you, you did it. And then we just send them on their merry way. And that's, that's just, it doesn't work. There's just no, no way to do that. There's just no way. There's, it doesn't work to do it like that. It's so much more than that. It's a process. You can't start at step five. It doesn't work for most people. Maybe it did for you. Maybe you're very smart and special. But in general, you have to start at the beginning. Do you believe that Jesus is God's son and our king? Do you believe that he came to illustrate and demonstrate what God is like? And on and on and on. Up the steps. It's a 
process. It's a process we walk through by teaching and by living out the things that Jesus has taught us during his time on earth. And I think people like me get it wrong. But when you start to live this way, when you start by having conversations and washing feet and and, and forgiving and living humbly and, and letting go of our need for control, like you start having conversations around these topics, like discipleship just becomes so easy. Making more Jesus followers becomes so easy. I think we've overcomplicated it in the church. And that's why we... Uh, we take the idea of discipleship and we've kind of boiled it down to the idea of oikos, to your oikos. Because God has strategically and supernaturally placed 8 to 15 people in your life and those are the people where you have the greatest impact in sharing your story and getting those people to Jesus. And so to finish it off, Jesus says, and surely I am with you always until the very end of the age. And to make this specific to you, is, is any of your time or your resources, are they already allocated or predetermined? Are they dedicated to making more Jesus followers? Have you already set aside that time? Or are people spending their time and their resources trying to make a Jesus follower out of you? I know that might sting a little. But know that if you, anyone who calls Tribe Church home is spending their time and their resources trying to make a Jesus follower out of you, it is because they love you. And they can see a future that you can't quite see yet. They know what life looks like on the other side of forgiveness. They know what life looks like on the other side of humbling yourself. They know what life looks like on the other side of trusting God with your story and letting go of your need for control. So is there any of your time or your resources that are systematically set aside so that your life intersects with the king? Are you engaged in the business of your king or are you too caught up in minding your own business? Right now, there are people two doors down who are making tiny disciples, tiny Jesus followers. Or they're playing with your baby so that your full attention can be in here. And if you're part of that team, thank you so much because what you do matters so much. And we have people who give up their time on Sunday afternoons to make teenage size disciples, which is a big job. And all of the things that I could list forever and ever from the door to the coffee to the, to the music and the sound and the words and the video, all of it matters. All of that work matters because it's getting people closer to Jesus. We give through so many different things. I'm not going to list them all for you, but you, there's millions of things that we do around here. And it's, it's because we know that when we meet the needs of people in the name of Jesus, we are opening the door for them to become a follower of Jesus. These were Jesus' final instructions, and that makes them essential. Other people following them is literally how we got here today. And so fundamental number seven is Jesus' followers are multipliers. They're multipliers. And, and, and the thing about this is it's just, it's so cool because there is nothing like watching someone live out their story, a better story than they could have ever imagined because you could see a future that they couldn't see yet and you introduced them to Jesus or reintroduced them to Jesus or, or restored their faith in the, the, the church itself or, or whatever it is. You might not be the whole story. You might just be a small part of it. But at some point, you giving some of your time, some of your resources helped their life intersect with their king. And that's incredible to watch someone become a Jesus follower. And then the process just starts all over again because Jesus followers are multipliers. Okay, strap in because I have a lot to cover. I totally forgot exactly how to, how to fold this thing and make it work. Oh, uh, yeah, and then it just, it closed out. Okay. Huh? You'll do this? Oh, okay, very, that's perfect, great, thank you. 
All right. So I was watching, uh, this is a long time ago, but I was watching a famous atheist on YouTube speaking at a university, and he talked specifically about the absurdity of Christianity. And although this isn't like the primary focus of his talk, it was a significant part of it. And as I listened, something struck me about his entire argument that was based on an assumption, a false one, but one that many Christians, particularly evangelical Christians, hold. It was the same assumption most of us were raised with. Even with my limited understanding growing up, it's something that I heard as well. The false assumption was that Christianity's foundation and viability depend on the Bible being free of errors, known as an inerrant Bible. His entire argument rested on this premise. He highlighted various errors in the Bible, historical, scientific, and, uh, scientific, scientific, and some seemingly absurd aspects, particularly in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament. His point was, if these aspects aren't true, the Bible isn't true, and it can't be trusted. If the Bible isn't completely accurate in all respects, why believe any of it? Therefore, he concluded we should abandon Christianity altogether. But according to his misguided assumption, which unfortunately many Christians still hold, and which we are discussing today, the legitimacy of Christianity is precariously balanced on the notion that it rests atop a collection of errorless or inerrant ancient texts. The premise of his talk was clear. Dismantle the text, and you dismantle the Bible, dismantle the Bible, and you dismantle Christianity. His argument implied that if there's even a single error in the Bible, then Christianity becomes indefensible. It's like a house of cards. Remove the creation account, Leviticus, or some parts of the New Testament, and the whole structure collapses. Goodbye Bible, goodbye Christianity. However, this perspective is not accurate, which will be reassuring to some of you, but may sound like heresy to others. So we'll just pay attention, okay? Today, we conclude this series with our eighth topic. We'll be discussing the Bible. The topic is somewhat unique because Jesus never directly mentioned the Bible as it wasn't compiled in the way that we know it until the fourth century. However, we still need to ask, what must we believe about the Bible to be a follower of Jesus? In other words, what is essential? And I want to address those of you who may have left the, the Christian faith due to something uh, raised, something related to the Bible. If that's you, I'm so glad you're listening uh, or maybe even watching today. This message is for you. Here's the thing. Many of you were probably given a Bible as a child. When it was first presented to you, it was introduced as God's word, completely true in every way. Like many of you, I, I believed this like before I even read it, right? At least that's what they're, they're, that's what they're telling me. Most evangelical Christians, including myself, hold some view of the Bible's inspiration, infallibility, or inerrancy. All right? You probably do, too. However, uh, and I'm not criticizing, just pointing out something obvious. Many people who use these terms might not be able to define them precisely. They may just believe that God gave us his word and that it is inspired, infallible, or without errors. When I first got into ministry, well, I was told I did a pretty good job preaching for someone who didn't go to Bible college. Um, since then, I have two master's degrees and a doctorate, so that comment might have got to me. Um, the point is, is that it took me on a very long path of studying the Bible and theology. In the course of acquiring all of those expensive pieces of paper, I did studying and reading across a variety of topics, including what we will be talking about today. Also, a great book that I think is very understandable, but not an academic textbook on this subject we are talking about today is Irresistible by Andy Stanley. Uh, before we go any further, here's the bottom line. Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. All right, to be a follower of Jesus, you must believe the Bible essentially boils down to this, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John provide reliable accounts of actual events. That's it. If you accept any of these four Gospels as a trustworthy record of real events, you're on the right path. All four Gospels present Jesus as God's Son and your King. Everything we discussed in this series stems from that truth. If the accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John are reliable, then what Jesus said about God is true, and what he said about you is true. And what he said about the Hebrew Scripture is true. Christianity does not depend on proving that the Bible is without error. People followed Jesus for over 300 years before the first Bible was assembled. First century Christians didn't follow Jesus because of something that they read. They followed him because they saw him crucified and then raised from the dead. People want to make the Christian faith rise and fall on the inerrancy of the Bible or sometimes a certain Bible, but none of them are running around saying Paul isn't a true Christian because he didn't read or even have the King James Version of the Bible. If there's a case to be made for the Bible being without error, is there a case? Yes, absolutely. If you give me three weeks of your undivided attention, I could probably make that case for you. However, is this the view of the Bible essential to being a follower of Jesus? No. Our faith does not hinge on proving the Bible has no errors. Christianity stands or falls on the identity of Jesus, which is validated by his resurrection. 
This is why it's crucial. My specific area of study was apologetics, which is the word they used to describe the defense of faith. As a result, I watched countless, countless, countless debates um, between atheists and apologists and uh, uh, other religions. I even participated in some myself. But here's what I noticed about all those debates. Christian, Christian apologists always base their arguments on the resurrection of the Bible, not the inspiration of the Bible. Sorry. Resurrection of Jesus, not the inspiration of the Bible. They understand that the foundation of our faith is not an inspired text, but the event of Jesus' resurrection. To emphasize the importance of this point, I want to share with you one of the most overlooked yet crucial statements in the New Testament, written by the Apostle Paul, who authored about half of uh, the New Testament. We've examined this before, but its significance cannot be overstated. If you've lost faith over something in the Bible, please listen closely. Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, could have claimed that the Bible is the foundation of our faith. However, here's what he actually said. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. Paul's entire ministry, his life-risking journey around the Mediterranean, Mediterranean are pointless if Jesus did not rise from the dead. This means that not just Paul's preaching, but also the preaching of Peter, John, Luke, James, and brother of Jesus, and Matthew, all of it's useless if the resurrection didn't happen. Paul is telling us that the integrity of his entire ministry and the message of the early Christian preachers hinges on the resurrection of Jesus, an event that took place outside the walls of Jerusalem. Then he reinforces his point. Not only is his preaching useless, but so is your faith. So is your faith. And you might think, wait a minute, that's unfair. You don't even know me. But Paul would respond, I don't have to know you. If you're basing any of your life on the claims or teachings of Jesus, it's all in vain unless the resurrection happened. The only reason we take the rabbi from Nazareth seriously is because the resurrection confirmed his claims about himself. The issue with Jesus wasn't his teachings. It was his claims about who he was. Only a crazy person or someone who was truly is who he says would make such claims. The resurrection validated Jesus' claims to be the Son of God, the resurrection and the life and your King. And Paul doesn't stop there. A few verses later he says, If Christ has not been raised from the dead, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. You think, wait, no, I'm not in my sins. I asked Jesus into my heart. And Paul and Peter would say, it's a fairy tale. If the resurrection didn't happen, none of it's true. Everything I've done, all your faith is fiction. You've just convinced yourself it's true. None of this is real, and none of that matters except for that one pivotal event, the resurrection which changed everything. Without it, you are still separated from God because no one has paid for your sins, and Jesus' claims about himself would be false. Paul's point is the foundation of our faith is the resurrection, which sparked a movement of the church that eventually compiled the first Bible in the fourth century. So is the Bible important? Absolutely. It's extraordinarily important. But the Bible is not the foundation of our faith. It is certainly not irrelevant to it. Here's my crucial point. There is no single modern view of inspiration that is essential to following Jesus. That's why I want to address this. There's no single modern view of inspiration that is essential to following Jesus. Now, some of you might be thinking, I don't even care about this. You're raising questions I've never asked. Can we just talk about something practical? I understand that. We'll get back to that. Some of you might be wondering why this is important. It's extraordinarily important to you, to me, to us, and also to our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. Let me explain why. When a specific view of inspiration whether it be verbal inspiration, inerrancy, or another perspective, it's elevated to the level of doctrine or considered essential, the Bible can become an obstacle of faith for some people. In other words, when a particular view of inspiration is given the same status as the belief that Jesus is the Son of God, the Bible can unfortunately turn into a stumbling block. And this is why I urge you, essentially, if you left the faith because of something about in or, or sorry, about or in the Bible to lean back and just listen for a few minutes. When we elevate a specific view of inspiration to the status of essential doctrine, we eliminate room for questions. It leads to responses like, well, I can't explain it, but that's what the Bible says, so don't question it. This approach stifles curiosity and honest inquiry and in making it harder for people to engage with their faith authentically. That's what God's word says, but I don't understand. Well, you don't need to understand, just accept it and move on. This mindset discourages questions and curiosity. For those of us raised to believe like this, not only are they discouraged from being curious, but sometimes they can't even be honest. They read parts of the Bible and think, I don't want to read that part anymore, or I don't like that part. Uh, for instance, the image of Jesus with a sword in his mouth, ready to uh, smite his enemies, can be unsettling. So we might focus 
on uh, the parts like uh, such as Psalms and the general teachings of Jesus and leave the rest out for someone else to figure out. You can't even be honest about your own faith and your view of the Bible. When your kids ask about those difficult questions, you find yourself saying, don't look at those parts, focus on the other parts. But that's not a healthy way to live, to worship, or to approach God. The creator of over 600 different types of beetles surely encourages curiosity and open-mindedness. Our faith isn't anchored to a flawless text. It's anchored to a singular event outside the walls of Jerusalem that changed everything, including the lives of those who knew Jesus personally. We've been taught that the error in any part of the Bible undermines the credibility of all of it. This argument, we hear this argument frequently. Yes, an error in any part of it might seem to undermine the credibility of all of it, just like your passport. But our faith is not dependent on an error-free text. It's based on the resurrection of Jesus. This all-or-nothing view of the Bible is mistaken and unnecessary. It creates unnecessary off-ramps to faith and sets people up for a crisis of faith due to apparent discrepancies and contradictions. This is fascinating to me as I enjoy church history. The early Christians, those who followed the apostles and those who wrote, led, suffered, and died to protect those ancient texts were not bothered by apparent contradictions or disagreements within the Bible. For the first five centuries of Christendom, these issues didn't trouble anyone. They weren't hung up on the fact that some details didn't align perfectly or that certain parts of the Old Testament were difficult to understand. They, were concer- they weren't concerned about those issues. The group that followed the apostles and they were martyred or died for and it was known as the church fathers, many of their church fathers actually knew the apostles and were trained by them. They didn't get hung up on the textual details that we often do today. For example, there was a 4th century bishop from Constantinople named John Christendom. Okay, If you read church history, you might come across quotes by him. He addressed this apparent contradictions of misalignments in the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, and John. Regarding the different accounts of the resurrection of Jesus, he acknowledged they don't line up perfectly. You, you know, it's like, was there one person or four? There are many Marys who arrived first. The details just don't match up, right? Agnostics and critics often point to these inconsistencies, asking why we should believe the gospels if they didn't even align perfectly. However, the men and women who brought us the gospels were not troubled by these discrepancies. Neither were the subsequent generations, including the church fathers. For example, um, John Chrysostom addressed the issue. He, his writings might seem clunky because they're old and translated, but here's what he said about differing accounts in the Gospels. Uh, but if there be anything, time or places, which, have, uh, which they have related differently, this nothing injures the truth of what they have said. He noted that there are differences in the details, such as time and places, which the gospel writers have related differently. It wasn't concerning. In other words, they told the same stories, but with different details. This does not harm the truth of their message. In other words, we don't feel the need to smooth out the rough edges and make everything align perfectly. We understand the main point that they're trying to convey. Which, but those things which constitute our life and furnish out our doctrine, nowhere is any of them found to have disagreed. Not No, not ever so little. He continues, nothing in those matters of our lives, um, to live our lives and develop our doctrine, there is no disagreement among them. Essentially, he's saying that the details may not match up perfectly, but that doesn't matter. We understand the core message, and everyone agrees that Jesus rose from the dead. The reason I mentioned the word um, modern is crucial. The The precision we expect from written text today, correct grammar, accurate spelling, perfect alignment, was not an expectation in ancient times. The ancient writers and audiences were not concerned with the exactness we demand today. In our modern world, we demand such precision. We have the means to achieve it. However, in ancient times, the situation was different. Most people were illiterate, not due to a lack of intelligence, but because there was just nothing to read, okay? So (laughs) they moved on. In primary illiterate society, the level of precision we expect from written text today was not even considered. Is there a case to be made for the Bible being without error? Yes. But is it holding that view essential to following Jesus? No. If this was an issue that led you to leave faith, you should reconsider. I understand this message may be troubling for some of you, especially those of you who are more conservative in your theological views, but it's important to recognize these historical contexts and reevaluate our perspectives. Our approach to ministry collectively is guided by something the Apostle Peter said at a crucial moment in the life of the early church. After about 20 years after the resurrection, there was a significant meeting recorded in Acts chapter 15. Some of you might be familiar with this. The church was facing a major conflict, and it revolved around Scripture. 
not the Bible as we know it, since the Gospels hadn't been written yet, and the Apostle Paul was just beginning to write. The conflict was about the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, the Jewish or Hebrew scriptures. However, the issue wasn't about whether these texts were inspired. It was about how much they should be applied, which was the bigger deal. It's difficult to convey the intensity and the emotion that would have been in that room as they debated the role of scriptures in the early church. They didn't call it the Bible. It was simply the books or the Jewish scriptures. Christians later referred to it as the Old Testament, but to the Jewish people, it was their Bible. Their pressing question was, what do we do with these texts? One group argued the Gentiles must learn and follow these scriptures to become Christian. They believed the Gentiles had to adopt Jewish customs, embrace the Messiah as described by Moses, and follow Jesus' practices before they could accept Jesus as the Messiah. This meant learning Jewish culture, all that kind of stuff. In Acts 15, you could read about how they were debating uh, about whether Gentile men should be circumcised. It's a whole fun conversation. Their argument was that Gentiles had to join the covenant of Moses before they could be part of the new covenant. The group pushing this consisted of priests and Pharisees who had become Jesus followers. Fascinating to consider the people that were just, like, condemning Jesus are now Jesus followers debating about the future of the church. What could have possibly caused them to significantly change all of their beliefs? Probably a man coming back to life. Peter and Paul argued strongly against this, stating that the Gentile Christians, which include most of us, do not need to learn, memorize, study, or own a copy of the entire Old Testament law. They contended that the Gentiles were not required to follow commands that they gave to an- Moses gave to ancient Jews. They did, however, have some suggestions to integrate the Jewish and the Gentiles, right? Now James, who had just become a follower of Jesus after the resurrection because he saw his brother alive after he was dead, he input this. Brothers, all right, I've made a decision. Listen to me. Peter uh, descri- has described about how God first intervened to choose the people for his name, uh, uh, choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. Peter, Peter had just described an incredible story about, uh, it's almost hard to believe, but essentially he didn't want to go into a home because he was like, hey, I came here. I didn't want to come, but you guys are all unclean, but I'm here because God told me to. It was a really fun interaction. Um, read it. It's, re- it's interesting. So Peter says, look, I get it. I'm just about as anti-Gentile as all of you, just as worried about getting Gentile uncleanliness on me. But I'm telling you, God opened a whole new world. And it, if that means adjusting our perspective, our perspective to our own scripture to let him in, we should. So he says, James said, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. In other words, if our scriptures have become an obstacle, we need to remove the barrier. These men and women were seeking to enter the kingdom of God. We must not allow our Bible to hinder their faith. The core of our faith is a new king. The one our text pointed to has come just as the early church decided not to make it difficult for the Gentiles to come uh, to God. We must ensure the Bible does not become an obstacle for us. Is the Bible important? Absolutely. Is it essential? Yes. But it should never be a barrier because the Bible isn't the starting point of our faith. Jesus is. I can already hear the critics, but the Gospels are in the Bible. Let's revisit a historical context. It's a flawed argument to say the Gospels rely on the Bible as we know it because Matthew and Mark were written before the Bible was assembled. So there's no argument to be made. The real issue is who is Jesus? That's the starting point, the ending point, the core of our faith. So what must we believe about the Bible to be followers of Jesus? It's a comprehensive answer. The Bible documents God's redemptive activity in the world culminating in the arrival of his final king. Uh, I'm skipping to the end, sorry. <laughs> we would not be lost to God anymore. That's the truth. That's what God came so that we would not be lost to God anymore, but that we would experience eternal life. That is the good news of great joy for all people. I know there are many still sitting and saying, but you have to understand the Bible. Eschatology, justification, sanctification, theories of atonement, a deep understanding of the attributes of God, the difference between complementarianism and egalitarianism, and, of course, the inerrancy of Scripture. That is the only true way to be a Christian and get to heaven. You need the Bible to do that. And when we get to heaven, we can ask the thief on the cross next to Jesus if that's true. The man said today, Jesus said to him, today, you will be with me in paradise. He didn't understand the inerrancy of scripture. He didn't have the Bible. He asked Jesus to remember him in his kingdom, and Jesus said, yes. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, it's amazing grace. It's an amazing story. It's amazing that we even have the story. It's all amazing, and I pray that whatever this lands with us, just a reminder or a call to renewal, a call to repentance, that we just lean in and say, God, if that's true, have your way with me. So please just... Give us the wisdom to know what to do with what we just heard and encourage to embrace it with our lives. And would you please raise up Christians, Jesus followers, churches for your sake, for the kingdom's sake. In Jesus' name, amen.